Well, how far did I get? Well, welcome to the Fast Center webinar. Did I get that far last time? <laughs> or I get caught up, maybe? Okay. So our Chris, our presenter, Chris Parmley, will be helping us to explore the NIH Omnibus, and she'll share insights on how to use this information provided in the annual open solicitation to prepare an NIH application. So a proud graduate of Indiana University School of Public and Environmental Affairs, Chris is also the president of Parmley Consulting Group and is also a member of the Illinois Fast Center Consultant Team. She started her career at an Indianapolis-based nonprofit in program development and management. After gaining initial experience in fundraising, Chris launched her own venture in 2000 with a focus on private foundation and federal grants. Fast forward to 2005, she expanded her experience to include SBIR, STTR, and for the past for the past many years, she has focused almost exclusively on SBIR, STTR, project management services. So I hand it over to you, Chris. Thanks, Sherry. I appreciate that. So today we're going to talk about the omnibus. Um, I had a hard time sort of preparing slides for this because I... Uh, anyway, I might be switching back and forth between the actual omnibus and my slides. Um, if I don't, the slides aren't very exciting for this, unfortunately, because it's a lot of text, but hopefully it will still um, hold your attention. So today we're going to um, talk about the omnibus itself, um, and then the omnibus references uh, additional documents, one of which we will talk about, which is the project descriptions and the research topics covered by the omnibus for both in or for NIH, CDC, and FDA. And then I'm going to share a little bit about how to use NIH's um, report tool. When I was making my slides yesterday, um, the server for the report site was down. So I'm, I'm hoping we have a little bit of time left today and I can do some of that live. Um, we'll, 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 I'll walk, keep a close eye on the time. So first, let's talk about the omnibus itself. So the Omnibus is the annual funding opportunity announcement issued by NIH. Um, it's typically released in the spring, shortly after the spring due date of April 5th. Um, and when uh, you go to NIH's website, the Omnibus actually has four separate uh, FOA or funding opportunity announcement numbers. Um, and they cover both uh, SBIR, is one, STTR is another, and then uh, each SBIR and STTR has a clinical trial required and a no clinical trial allowed uh, solicitation number. The omnibus is the open solicitation for NIH, um, so it allows for investigator-initiated topics. Um, you don't have to have a specific topic, and we'll go into a lot of detail about that in the future slides. Uh, but today I'm going to sort of cite my examples from the uh, solicitation for SBIR proposals where there are clinical trials not allowed. Again, if you have an application where there's a clinical trial allowed, you're actually going to use a different FOA number. Um, and if you have an STTR, you're going to use an even different FOA number. You do need those actual numbers and need to make sure that you're responding to the appropriate FOA uh, because that's required in the forms. So you will need to know that number. Whoops. So this is what the first page looks like of the, the omnibus. Um, and again, we're using the SBIR clinical trials not allowed. Um, the first thing that you see up top is the activity code. Um, the activity code is uh, what NIH, is, NIH uses to sort of uh, put certain funding opportunities in different buckets. Um, the SBIR and STTR program is what we call an R mechanism or research grant, and they always have either R41, 42, or 43 and 44. So today we're looking at the R43 and 44, uh, which covers the SBIR phase one and phase two. This uh, omnibus <laughs> also covers uh, fast track applications if you happen to be doing a fast track, as well as the direct to phase two. 
Um, it tells the announcement type. The reason that this is important is because if you're looking at a previous omnibus or a different solicitation, this tells you that this is a reissuance. So this will change in April when they release the new solicitation. Um, this The new solicitation will show a reissuance of, of this year's. This uh, next section is related notices, and this can be important. You can see that um, in this one, uh, there was a, a notice published um, related to changes in the budget amounts, which we'll talk about in great detail, um, but that was pu published November 1st. Um, and then they have some older notices published here, but that means that these are relevant to the solicitation and they may provide additional and updated information. So always look at the related notices with any solicitation that you're working on. Here's that FOA number again um, that you'll need to complete your forms. Um, and then this talks about um, a couple of other, um, some other just numbers and acronyms for you. Uh, but then this is really a great little summary right here, the funding opportunity purpose. Now for this solicitation for the omnibus, it's pretty general. Um, for other more specific solicitations, that might give you a really good synopsis if, if that's um, an opportunity that is appropriate for, for your project or not. And then um, next we moved on to some important dates. So there's the date posted, which is the original date that the solicitation was issued. Um, the open date is the earliest date that you could submit an application. The omnibus follows NIH's three standard due dates, um, which we'll look at in the table below. So the standard due dates for SBIR and STTR are September 5th. January 5th and April 5th. It's 5 p.m. local time on that due date. And if the due date falls on a holiday, it's the next business day. Uh, so for example, if September 5th was Monday um, and it was a holiday, it was Labor Day, then we submit it on September 6th by 5 p.m. Um, you can see that a long time ago, applications that focused on AIDS-related topics had different due dates. They no longer do. They now use the standard due dates as well. And then on the right side of this table, the Scientific Merit Review tells you when your proposal is going to be reviewed. Um, the Advisory Council Review date tells you the approximate time that your proposal would be uh, selected for funding. And then the earliest start date is the last date that you see in this table. Uh, this is important for your internal planning, but it's also uh, required to be put, if there's a spot on your forms where they ask for the uh, start date of your project, and you are expected to use this, this start date off of the table uh, when you fill out your application. And you can see down here, the expiration date of this solicitation is April 6, 2023. That's when we anticipate, that's the day after the last due date in this cycle. Um, and we anticipate that they will release a new omnibus shortly thereafter. Now the omnibus will not change very much. Um, so if you want to get a jump on your application for the September deadline, um, even though this one expires April 6th, you'd be safe to sort of use this for guidance. Um, you'd want to read the new omnibus once it was released but it's gonna be pretty much the, the uh, follow the same, the same standard outline. Next in the omnibus in the actual form online, um, and this is, I feel like I want to show, I'm going to switch my screen for just a second so you can see what I'm, when I say, so this is, this is the actual site, NIH's site, and the easiest way to get to it is just Google NIH SBIR. Um, and this is the solicitation that we're looking at. And so I'll show you, it's literally just a web page. So I'm just working us through this, this web page. I'm going through all the major sections, but this is what it looks like actually live and online. And these are all hot links. So anything in here that you see that you want to learn more about, you just have to click on. So now I'm gonna go back to my slides, okay. So the next part of that um, gives you access to the forms. Um, now, uh, if you're familiar with NIH, you know that the way you submit your application is actually through ERA Commons, which is their, um, uh, their communication portal. Um, and inside EIA, 
EAR Commons, the ERA Commons, sorry, there is a second platform called Assist. And Assist hosts all of the uh, applications. And so we go into Assist and you put in that FOA number and it magically brings up the forms. So within the Omnibus, there's actually a link to the Assist uh, website. I think it's easier to simply log yourself into Commons, click on the Assist link, and then enter the FOA number but it does have a, a link for you. Um, then it goes into a description of the actual funding opportunity. Now, this is also really great stuff to read, especially if you're not familiar with the program. Um, you should probably read this every time a new solicitation is released, just to make sure that things are consistent and um, have carried over. But it goes through the background of the SBIR and SCTR program. It covers the purpose of the, the various phases. So if you're curious about what an NIH fast track is, it gives you a description. If you're curious about a direct to phase two, it gives you a description. It also goes into the specific objectives of the program. And you can see the very first thing right here is a hot link for the program descriptions and research topics of NIH, CDC, and FDA. We're going to dive deeper into that uh, in just a minute. Um, and so I will take you to what that looks like. But the program descriptions um, are, are cover the uh, topics issued by all of the institutes and centers. Um, this is a targeted funding opportunity. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, my apologies. Uh, the program descriptions are cover the omnibus, but there is also program specific targeted funding opportunities. Those will not be listed in the omnibus, but you can find those on NIH's page. And it's important to know that when we talk about these topics and we're gonna look at some and we're gonna look at the, the um, research topic document, um, you are not required to identify a particular topic uh, or an awarding component before you submit. So you submit your application to NIH um, through a, a single portal called the Center for Scientific Review. And so uh, whether you submit your application, whether you want your application to be funded by the National Cancer Institute or the National Eye Institute, those all go to Center for Scientific Review. And so you're submitting that, that single application to NIH. Why that's important is because it means you cannot submit the same project to multiple institutes and centers. You can only submit one application for all institutes and centers to NIH for the same work. I have a slide that covers that a little bit more in detail later. Um, if you don't specify what institute or center you want to be matched up with, uh, CSR will make that assignment for you. Um, and the majority of the time, 99% of the time, it, it's right. Um, so, but it is, we'll talk about strategies of why you would recommend that uh, pick an institute or center later. The next part of the, the uh, omnibus goes into the um, award information. And so you can tell they list the types of applications that are allowed. Again, the omnibus covers SBIR clinical trial, SBIR no clinical trial, STTR clinical trial, STTR no clinical trial. And within those solicitations, those four solicitations, they cover all of the types of applications that are allowed. That includes a phase one, a fast track, a direct to phase two, a phase two, a phase two B, and resubmissions. Those are all covered by those same solicitations. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the next part of the omnibus, which covers the award budget. Um, new budget information was released on, on November 1st. Uh, it replaces the current budget language, and the only difference is the total amount. Uh, so this is what how the, the omnibus should read now, is that total funding support normally may not exceed $295,000 for a phase one and $1.9 million for a phase two. For specific topics, NIH may exceed these total award amounts. The current list of approved topics can be found at, and they give you a hot link to the topics for budget waivers. We're gonna dissect all of this language because uh, it's really important. Um, each participating component, which means institute or center, may also set their own budget higher or lower than the above. 
Uh, applicants are strongly encouraged to contact the program officer prior to submitting any applications in excess of the total award listed above. In all cases, this is the most important statement in all of this, in all cases, applicants should propose a budget that is reasonable and appropriate for completion of the research project. Now, the one line that I wish they would put at the end of that is your research project that you propose needs to be appropriate for the phase. So that means I, I, it would be totally normal to, su to submit a phase one proposal that is, let's say, has a budget of 315000 that is a year long project, you're demonstrating feasibility, um, you know, you're doing some, some basic work. It would not be appropriate to submit a phase one that is a two year project with a budget of 1.5 million that includes a very large animal study and human subjects. That is outside the scope of a phase one. So while there is room to adjust your budget, you need to make sure that the project that you're submitting is consistent with the phase that you're submitting for. So those two things need to align. So that normally may not exceed is sort of loosey goosey language. Um, and it's given as uh, a range of budgets that you should target. Now, very rarely do, do I put in a phase one application that is 295,000 on the nose. The average phase one that I'm putting in right now is about 330. For, and then the next thing is for specific topics, NIH may exceed these award amounts. We're going to look at some of those topics, um, but the NIH has received waivers uh, from the Small Business Administration to exceed these budget amounts for a number of topics. And then again, there's that sentence, you know, that, that in all cases, applicants should propose a budget that's reasonable and appropriate for the completion of the research project. Budget is not considered uh, in the review process. The only thing that reviewers look at budget for is, is it fair and consistent for the work proposed? Um, so they're not really making a judgment. There's no extra points given if you come in right at 295, uh, your, your budget should match the work proposed. So here's a look at some waiver topics. This is the link. If you click on that link, it takes you to this document. There are 41 pages of waiver topics, okay? So it's not hard to find a way to sort of uh, um, get your, your project to fit in within waiver topics. Most of the work that you're going to propose with these proposals will follow under a waiver topic, um, especially work that involves human subjects or animals. These are a couple of each institute or center, uh, and there are 24 institutes and centers that participate in SBIR. Each institute and center has their own list of topics that qualify for waiver. But if you look at some of these examples, you can see how incredibly broad they are. Um, so for example, NIDDK, the development or evaluation of pharmacological agents, gene therapies, novel formulations, blah, 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 for the invention, the intervention or prevention of diabetes and digestive and kidney disease. That is very broad. I'm guessing if you're submitting an SBIR to NIDDK, we will be able to find a waiver topic that you could qualify for. So here are just a look at a couple, and, and they're all like that. They're all, all of the 24 institutes and centers uh, that have waiver topics are very broad like that. Um, I will talk a little bit more about budgets when we go into the research topics, because we'll look at the budget uh, guidelines issued by those individual institutes and centers. For right now, we're still kind of looking at the major sections of the overall omnibus. The next section is eligibility information. They go through um, eligible organizations. Uh, so those are organizational requirements to meet the Small Business Administration's definition of small businesses that are eligible to participate in SBIR. Those are things like 500 or fewer employees, U.S.-based, um, owned and operated by a U.S. citizen um, or a group of U.S. citizens. They cover the required registrations um, that are, are needed in order for you to successfully submit. And then they spend some time talking about eligible individuals, which would be the principal investigator, um, either at the company for an SBIR or the principal investigator at that's at the uh, research institution if you're doing an STTR. 
Uh, primarily that uh, eligible individual, if you're doing an SBIR, means that the principal investigator must be more than 50% employed at the company during the project period. There is no cost share requirement with SBIR. In fact, we don't uh, even talk about other money coming into the project when you work on your budget and you provide your budget justification or when you do your work plan. You don't talk about anything that is not funded specifically by the, the um, SBIR dollars that you're requesting. So we don't bring other money into the table or onto the table. Uh, they cover some additional information about eligibility. Uh, importantly, the number of applications uh, so you can submit more than one application as long as it's scientifically distinct. What does not work is if you have a technology, let's say you have a medical device that has applications in both um, uh, NIDDK for kidney and cancer at NCI. You cannot submit the same application and replace the word kidney with cancer. Uh, that won't work um, because, again, you're submitting both of those applications to NIH. So it's essentially the same work just because it covers a different disease state doesn't, doesn't qualify. You could, however, submit multiple applications for different work. So as long as the work is different enough. Uh, and they do use um, computer screeners to find those things. So um, it, it has to be pretty substantially different. Um, they also talk about the con contractual con uh, consortium agreements. So if you're doing an SBIR, and uh, many of these things are covered in other resources available for the FAST Center where we go through the basics of the program. Uh, but if you're doing an SBIR, the company must do 66% of the work. If you're doing an STTR, the company is required to do a minimum of 40% of the work. The next section talks about the application and submit submission package. Um, it provides a link to the actual instructions on how to complete the application. Again, we're not covering that today, but there are other resources available from the FAST Center that do cover the step-by-step -step instructions for the, the submission. And finally, there's a se section about the application review information and your scoring criteria description, as well as a award administration. So now I wanna spend some time talking about those program descriptions and research topics um, what we just did was the omnibus, which is again, the big umbrella, and it points you to the individual institutes and centers for more information. Sherry, do we have any questions about the omnibus in general? I don't, I don't see any in the chat right now. Okay, but perfect. Thanks for stopping and asking. No problem. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We had one come through. Okay. Just in the nick of time. Okay, it says, if some work needs to be done um, by out of country contractors within the scope of the application, can the company pay the contractors using its own money? And will this negatively impact the application? Wow, that's a pretty specific question. Um, can we uh, take that at the end or offline? Let's Perfect. do that. Okay. okay. So the uh, topics, um, and I would like to, I'm going to change how I'm sharing my screen. There's probably an easier way to do this technically, but you know, I'm not the most technically savvy girl. So um, I want you to just see what the topics look like when you hit that link. It goes to a PDF that's downloadable, which is great because then you can search it. Um, so you can use keywords to search it, uh, but this is the actual topics. Um, this is also issued every year, like the omnibus. It also, like the omnibus, changes very little from year to year. Um, so you can expect the general topics to stay relatively similar. Uh, some of the information up front about each institute and center may change, and we'll look at what that looks like. Um, but but the general topics are going to be pretty much the same. There are um, you are able to see you know some particular institutes and centers may have um, hot topics or emerging topics um, and and those would be kind of upfront and and separated out on the new solicitation. So what the um, program description covers and research topics covers the 24 institutes and centers that participate in the program. There's over 200 topics, 200 pages of topics. 
Um, so again, if you're working on something in public health, it's probably going to be in those 200 pages. NIH even says, though, very clearly that if it's not in those 200 pages and it's still focused on public health, they would like to see your proposal. So you are not bound by finding a topic within that the list of research topics. The institutes and centers, or the ICs, are organized by biological system. Um, so this is unlike the study sections that will review your proposal, which are actually organized by technology and scientific domains. Um, so there might be a study section on imaging. They don't care if you're imaging for, for cancer or kidney. It all goes to imaging, unlike the institutes and centers, which again are, are um, organized by those biological systems and disease states. All applications do have to be submitted in response to a funding opportunity announcement or a FOA. So we talked about there are four FOA numbers associated with the omnibus. You do need to decide whether you're doing SBIR, STTR, SBIR clinical trial, STTR clinical trial. So you have to do, you do have to decide that. Um, this list of program description and research topics applies only to the omnibus, not to special solicitations. So in addition to the omnibus, NIH issues targeted special solicitations. Um, they are typically put together by one or more institute and center. Uh, they're highly topical. They do still allow that investigator initiated interpretation or approach, uh, but they may be more specialized. So there are certain ones associated with um, uh, that there's the HEAL project, which has to do with uh, opioid pain management and opioid abuse. Um, there's the BRAIN initiative, which has to do with neurological issues. Um, so they, have, they do have special solicitations in addition to the omnibus. My default um, is the omnibus. And, um, you know, we could debate about, about special solicitation versus omnibus. Um, but in my experience, uh, the omnibus is the better way to go. And a couple of reasons for that. The first is that special solicitations do expire and the Institute or Center is under no obligation to renew those. Uh, most applications are not funded on the first submission. So you're looking at a pretty long cycle of submission to award um, and you need a lot of time. And so if you submit and you're focused on this special solicitation and then it expires, you're kind of screwed. Um, so we know the omnibus is going to be there. We know we can resubmit to the omnibus and it, it's going to change very little from year to year. In addition, uh, those special solicitations often have uh, specific study sections that have been organized to review those specific proposals. Now, sometimes that can be a good thing because you have highly uh, sort of focused experts Sometimes that can be a bad thing um, if you need to have more of a, like a diverse group reviewing your proposal. Um, and then in addition, sometimes there are real nuances and hangups on those special solicitations that are not clear in the guidelines um, and your proposal could not be funded or even kicked out um, if, if you don't fit perfectly what they're looking for. So I'm a big fan of the omnibus, not to say that you should never go for a special solicitation. I'm sure some people may argue the opposite, uh, but, but I'm a big fan of that. Um, and as we talked about, you do not need to, while you have to have a FOA, determine your specific FOA that you're responding to, you do not need to have a specific topic. This is really important that you remember you don't have to have a specific topic. So the first part of the, the uh, research topics goes through an overview of NIH in general. Again, this is all really good if you're brand new to the program. This is really great information. You should read this all before, uh, especially before contacting a program officer um, so that you become well-versed or better versed in the program and understand uh, NIH goals. So it covers NIH's goals, research support areas, and it gives contact information. Now, a couple of years ago, NIH sort of centralized its SBIR efforts, and they now have what they call the SEED Office, Small Business Education and Entrepreneurial Development. That is SBIR, STTR. People get confused sometimes and think that's some other special. That is SBIR, STTR. This is the email address for their general SEED Office. You can submit general questions to that uh, email address, and they'll shoot you back an answer. Um, and then in addition, you should contact your program officer uh, and we'll look at how to do that and where that information is. Um, it is highly encouraged 
but it is also not required. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about that process. And next comes the uh, descriptions of the ICs or institutes and centers. Just a little note, FDA is SBIR only. Um, CDC and NIH are both SBIR and STTR. So when you're looking at those individual institutes and centers, all 24 institutes and centers, what are we looking for? Well, first, um, you're going to find one that is interested in your technology. Again, it's not required, but it's helpful. If nothing else, it sort of helps you sort of narrow the scope of your project. Um, if you've been in any other workshops with the FAST Center, you may have heard one of the consultants talking about, you know, you can't submit your, your, your phase one, your proposal has to be pretty focused. You can't say we're going to cure all disease. You really have to start with one particular thing that you're going to focus on. Looking through these topics of the ICs will help you sort of narrow in on who, who might be um, the best fit that it will also provide you with appropriate contacts um, to reach out and discuss your proposal. Again, not required, but it is best practices. Most of those individual ICs, and we'll look at some sample contact information, um, also now have, especially the larger ones, some of the smaller ones don't have this, but uh, most of them have sort of an SBIR, STTR front door person um, who sort of manages, some have even more than one, um, who manages all the SBIRs, STTRs for their particular institute or center. This is different than the program officer. So this is sort of the person that helps you get to the right program officers. Most program officers carry other funding mechanisms in their portfolios. And so SBIR is part of what they do, but it's not all of what they do. So this person, this SBIR front door, sort of helps you get to the right program officer, takes a little bit of load off of them and make sure they're getting projects that are the right fit. If you already have an NIH program officer that you've worked with, for example, if you're a faculty member and you're transitioning to a company, or if you have a faculty member on your team, uh, that you're partnering with who already has an NIH program officer, start there. Um, let them know that you're applying for an SBIR. Here's the topic. You may even send them um, your specific aims. Even if they're not your right contact, they'll do a warm handoff, uh, which just sort of makes the process move a little bit faster. So that's a great place to start. Uh, the other thing that we're going to look at in this um, program description section is if an institute or center supports clinical trials. Now, that might not be an issue for phase one, um, but you really need to think about your project across the continuum from the very beginning. And uh, if you're going to propose something in phase two and that particular institute or center does not support clinical trials, uh, you, you need to know and you need a clinical trial in phase two. Um, you'd want to know that. We'll also get budget guidance on individual ICs from this document. Um, and will help get an understanding of the, the IC itself, sort of the size of, of the um, IC, its level of competitiveness, uh, benchmarks for success, and, and more information. Um, and we can also use NIH report for that. That's a great resource, which we'll cover at the end as well. So important to know, it's not just one of these things, but it's sort of all of these things. So this is sort of more art than science um, when we're sort of gathering information and putting these pieces of the puzzle together. And, and you don't even have to really solve any of that puzzle if you don't want to. You can just submit your proposal, let it be assigned and go through the process according to how NIH thinks it should go or actually through the, the Center of Scientific Review. Again, 99% of the time they're right. Um, so that, that's an option as well. So each of the 24 ICs has this information. NIH did a really great job or Department of Health and Human Services did a really great job sort of format, um, formalizing the format of each of these descriptions. This did not used to be the case. They used to be sort of all over the map. So now they're really nicely organized and you get the same information in the same order. So you can do apples to apples for every institute and center. So here's a look at what we're going to use NIAD as an example. Um, so you can first see the first thing they do is they give you their mission. Um, and then the next thing we go to is the budget guidance. Now, remember, we looked at the budget guidance from the omnibus. The omnibus recommended a budget. I think it's up to 295 now. Um, and they said there was that language again um, that the budget needs to be most importantly appropriate for the work. Um, so here is the specific institute or center 
budget guidance, which trumps the omnibus, because if you're applying to this institute or center, if you know your project is dead on for NIAD, you want to request your project goes to NIAD, um, then you can follow this budget guidance. And this is one of the reasons why we would research institutes and centers and identify one that you want to request is specifically to leverage uh, wider budget options. So for NIAD, um, they allow phase one applications with budgets up to 300,000 total cost per year for up to two years, which means you could technically le leverage $600,000 if you had a project that was required to span two years. Just had this conversation with somebody, they wanted to do a two year project period and request $600,000. And when I saw what they had planned in their project, there is no way that will take two years. They, it, they'll be lucky if it takes six months or nine months maybe, um, but a reviewer would never believe that that project would take two years. So you, ha you have to make sure that if you request two years, your project is appropriate for two years. They allow phase two budgets up to 1 million total cost per year for up to three years. So that means you could le leverage up to $3 million. Remember the cap, that we saw in the omnibus was closer to 1.9 over two years. So um, they say that you know they the budget levels must be very well justified, which of course I know you would do a very detailed budget justification if you followed the FAST Center workshops. And then there's that language again, that's very familiar language. In all cases, applicants should propose a budget that is reasonable and appropriate for the completion of the research project. So the most important thing to know about that is that budget is always negotiated at time of award. And so it's a real huge waste of your time to sit there and manipulate your budget to get it to 299.9 for NIH. There are other agencies where if you exceed that cap, your proposal will not be reviewed like NSF. That is not the case here. So for NIH, if they say their total, their, their um, applications typically are 300,000 total cost per year for a phase one, there is nothing wrong with going in with a budget that's 315,000 or 320,000. As long as you're prepared that they may come back and ask you to reduce that budget, happens all the time. On the flip side, the other thing that happens all the time is the agency does not ask for a reduction. So budgets are frequently rewarded as submitted and they exceed those numbers that are in the guidelines. Again, not always the case, depends on which cycle you're on, depends on the agency or the institute and center's budget that year. There's all kinds of moving factors. But the point is budget is ne negotiated at time of award. Now, if you remember the omnibus also said that if you're going to submit a budget that exceeds those amounts, you should get a prior approval from your program officer. But here's what NIAD says. NIAD says NIAD staff cannot provide prior approval to exceed hard caps. So you're not going to ask your NIAD program officer for permission to exceed that, that cap. Um, I would say, honestly, nine times out of 10, you're not going to ask your program officer for permission to exceed that cap uh, because at the prior to submission, the program officer isn't super interested in what your budget is. Where your budget comes into play is at the end. So what we do is we prepare a really detailed budget justification um, that we we clearly draw a link to the um, waiver topic, the SBA waiver topic for the budget to exceed. We we justify all the costs that exceed. We have a really solid work plan that's consistent with the scope of a phase one, um, and you know show reviewers that you're not asking for costs that are exorbitant or outside of the scope of work. This is especially true on projects that involve uh, human or animal subject studies. Animal studies are very expensive and a program officer would expect, expect your proposal to come in above that cap. Again, whether it's funded or not will depend on that negotiation period, but they would expect that. Uh, NIAD also directly addresses TABA funds, which are the technical and business assistance funds. Um, and they specifically point out that these costs can be requested in addition to the limits. So again, it wouldn't be unusual to, to have a budget that exceeds that 300,000. Um, I have just three other samples. So you can see the wide variation in budget guidance that we have from different institutes and centers um, and, and why you may shop institutes and centers. Um, 
this is uh, um, deafness and communication disorders. They allow phase one applications. Um, they say generally, generally, they will not fund phase one applications greater than 385,000. That's 85,000 more than NIAD said. NIAD is a way bigger institute or center, but they, these guys allow 85,000 more. And we know you could go even beyond that. Um, NINDS is 700,000 for a phase one. So that is neurological disorders and stroke. Um, they allow up to a phase one of $700,000. So if you had a choice to go between NIAD or NINDS, you know, if your technology fit within both, I would probably propose a higher budget and go into stroke. Now that's a more competitive, actually it's, it's not more competitive than uh, NIAD, it's probably more competitive. But, you know, you look at is the agency or the Institute of Center larger, smaller, more competitive, less competitive? Do you have a history with that particular institute or center? And then the bottom one is NCI, cancer. Um, and they allow phase ones up to 400,000. So again, you can see the variation between the particular institutes and centers. That's why it's really important to read this. But above all, guys, the most important thing to remember is you propose a budget that's consistent with the work. And you use those budget numbers as guidance, but they're not hard and fast in NIH. They just aren't. Um, this is a look at um, the rest of the, the section. So here they're talking about program staff. Um, for example, this is NIAD again. They have an entire small business team. Um, and they also have... Um, uh, excellent website. All of the particular institutes and centers have their own websites. Some of them are better than others. NIAS is particularly good. They have lots of sample proposals of successful proposals where you can go look at a winning NIAD proposal. Um, then they also tell you that, um, you know, they welcome any proposal that has to do with their, their uh, mission, even if you don't see the topic here. Uh, a couple years ago with the reauthorization, one thing that they changed was agencies had to be clearer in communicating the um, phase beyond phase two opportunities or phase two B. And so um, they can, all of them, most of the agencies in the, or the institutes and centers have a, um, some information about phase two B and mm -hmm. what that looks like. Um, in this case, they also talk about the NIH's commercialization readiness pilot. Um, that is an opportunity that is available in NIH um, that for phase two, you do not ask for TABA funds. You cannot do the CRP program and receive TABA funds, but CRP is competitive. So that is a competitive program that takes lots of time uh, to get awarded. TABA funds um, are included in your application. And then every institute or center includes this table. And this tells you whether or not they fund clinical trials. If they don't fund clinical trials through the omnibus, it provides you with a link to the opportunities that they do fund clinical trials for through. So for example, um, NIAD does not fund clinical trials through the omnibus, but they do fund clinical trials through other opportunities. So you could apply for a NIAD phase two clinical trial application, but it would be a U, which is a cooperative agreement. It would be a U44. Now, small businesses can apply and compete in U mechanisms. However, so can lots of other kinds of things. So typically, if given the option, the small business is best competing with an R4142 or an R4344 because you're the only thing that can compete in those, those mechanisms. Um, many people might be familiar with R01s or R21 research grants from NIH. Small businesses can apply for those, but you're going to be up against huge, huge universities with lots and lots of resources. So given the chance, we're always going to default to those R40 mechanisms. So that's not the best strategy to go with NIAD for, for if you have a clinical trial in phase two we might wanna look at some other institutes and centers. Okay, here's, yeah. 
we did a, a little bit ago, we had a question come in. I thought this was a nice little pause. And um, so let me go find it. I think it's a quick one. It says, can we submit the same application to both SBIR on the bus and non-SBIR pro programs, like a specific topic under NIH? So one to Omnibus. Yeah, and that's a really good question. Um, I would say, I think maybe the way they mean it is, can you submit, you know, an, an SBIR through the omnibus and then maybe an R21 or an R01 as a researcher for the same project? And the answer is no. Um, it would be considered overlapping work. And the worst possible thing that could happen is they would both end up in the same study section and people would see both applications right on top of each other. So it can be different work. It can be work that builds on the other, um, but it can't be the same. So that is a, a really important question. That's it. Thank you. All right. Yes, that's an important one. Thanks. You're, you're welcome. So here's a look. I want to share some topics with you from the uh, research topics document. So you can see once again, just like the SBA uh, waiver topics, you can see how broad these often are. So this is um, complementary and, um, uh, oh, I forget what it's called, all sort of alternative health. Um, and, and you can see these are really broad, broad topics. This is just one selection, one section of their many pages of topics. And here's um, NIBIB, which again, this is more, um, NIBIB is biological and biomedical engineering. This is more device focused, um, but you can tell again, these are really broad, broad things. These are what they're interested in. If you're working on something in public health, odds are in those 200 pages of topics, you're going to be able to find it. Okay, so let's say that you find a topic, you find an institute and center that you think you're a fit for. What do you do next? Well, the next best thing that's recommended is that you contact the program officer. Now we talked about some of those institutes and centers um, have SBIR, SCTR sort of front door contacts. Um, you can see on the left-hand side of the screen is NIA, which is aging. They do have a small business contact um, and it's Dr. Kearns and it has all of his information there. In addition, to Dr. Kearns, which would be the appropriate front door. So if an IC has a small business contact, that's where you wanna start. If they don't, which is on the left-hand side, you find the person mm -hmm. who has the area of technology that most closely relates to yours. Now, in this particular one, they only have one contact for SBIR, and that's Dr. Lopez. Now you can see that Dr. Lopez, it says for additional information on research topics, contact Dr. Lopez. For administrative and business management questions, contact Dr. Rudberg. You want Dr. Lopez. If you're reaching out to a program officer, you do not need to contact the administrative grants or business person that's gonna be listed. Some list them, some don't, but you want the research topics person. If they have that small business person, go, go to that person first. Otherwise, go to the, the person that um, is in your, your research area. And when you contact them, um, you really, the, again, best practices, you can, you can do it any way you want, but best practices would be that you prepare your specific aims document. It needs to be one page. It needs to follow the standard format and, and expected order of information of an aims page which I'm sure the FAST Center has a resource on. And you attach that via email for them um, as a PDF. You send an introductory email um, asking you know, for a brief call to discuss an upcoming submission. Um, you can shop your project with more than one institute and center. Some may, uh, you may get interest from more than one, uh, which is fine. Um, you may not hear back from any, uh, which happens sometimes. So if you don't hear any response, you can certainly follow up with within seven to 10 business days. Uh, I also like to put in the email three or four times that you're available for that call. It just sort of helps with, with scheduling. Um, a couple of really important things about that. Um, 
you do not need their approval or invitation to submit. So if you do not hear back from this person, it can't stop you from submitting. Again, it's best practices. Um, I would say 70% of the time we hear back. I would say 50% of the time the interaction with the program officer offers some really important insights. Um, we do it to try to capture those insights. If it doesn't happen, you can still move forward with, without uh, any worry. These folks are really busy. Um, and like I said, you know, SBIR is often a small portion of their portfolio. Um, if you're shopping with more than one institute or center and, and or even if you get one institute or center that says, we really like this project, it really aligns with us, I'd love to see this proposal. When you complete your forms, you can request assignment to a particular institute or center. Uh, it's an optional form and you attach that to your application. You request that institute or center. I think you can you can request up to, I think it's four. I know it's three. I know you can request three. Um, and what that does is if one in institute or center decides to pass, they can uh, make it available to the other institute or center. So if you have two that are interested, you know, feel free to list both of those. One thing that's really important um, is that you familiarize yourself with the rules and requirements uh, before you have a call with the PO. So you want to spare questions, spare questions from the PO for like, how do I submit or where do I find the guidelines? Um, this is really a call for you to listen um, and see if you can get some valuable information from them. Um, an example is, you know, I had a client one time developing a, um, uh, they had a particular platform for developing drugs for pediatrics, and um, they were using sinusitis as the sort of with, you know, they're going to develop it within that for sinus, sinusitis as the prototype. And the program officer said, oh, Reviewers have no tolerance for sinusitis. They don't even care about it, you know. Use this instead, you know. So that that kind of little bit of information can really improve your proposal. That's the kind of stuff that we're looking for. Don't always get it. That's fine. You just kind of go through the motions. Um, but but every once in a while we get some really good stuff. Um, okay, so again, it's a listening call, not a talking. Um, and you're going to ask specifically if the, pro the aims you proposed align with what they're funding. You might also get uh, other really great things like, hey, you know, if you're not in animal studies in phase one, you're not going to be competitive. Um, or, you know, there's a particular IC where if you're not in human by phase two, you're not competitive. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that we want to know. All right, Sherry, any, any more questions? No new questions since the last one I asked. All right, I am going to share, uh, I'm gonna go to Reporter Live. Whoops, hold on. Okay, so Report is NIH's um, repository of data and, um, oops, I lost it. And you can get all kinds of really great information here, um, including information about particular institutes and centers. And they even have a page that is specific toward uh, SBIR and STTR. So you can really sort of um, digest lots of information. Let's see if I can, okay. But what I like it for is um, you can look at funded projects in your area, in your technology area, and you can determine which institute or center might be appropriate. So for example, we could do, um, okay, now if we do just a regular search for something like breast cancer, it pulls up all of the, the uh, projects, but we can come to, advanced search and we can go down here to funding mechanism mm -hmm. oops SBIR and then it will show you all of the SBIRs 
oh, darn it, it didn't work. I knew I shouldn't do this live. I'm horrible at technology. I think the drop down didn't, there you go. Okay, okay, thank you. We had another question, Roland, while you're playing with this. Um, yeah. The question is, what impact scores are usually funded? Uh, interesting question. Um, it depends on the institute and center and it's a moving target. So um, unlike other research grants, SBIRs do not receive percentile scores. So it is the impact score that determines whether you get funded or not. Um, for example, NCI, cancer, um, it would be really difficult to get, get, to get funded with an impact score probably less than like a 22. Um, but aging NIA dips down to 32. So it, it just depends. And it's a moving target. Um, even depends, you know, September is the end of the agency's fiscal year. The federal fiscal year is October through September. And, um, if you submitted a proposal in January that didn't get scored or didn't get funded, I'm sorry, did, it did get scored, but it maybe it had a 35 and the agency, the Institute and Center has leftover money. They may be dipping down to pick that up. Um, they typically dip down and pick up projects where they're familiar with the principal investigator. So hence why we reach out to the program officer and build a relationship. Um, the, one of the major primary tenets of fundraising is people give money to people. Um, and so this is a relationship-based program. And that's what you're doing when you reach out to that program officer is trying to build a relationship. Um, so it's a moving target, no idea. And, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use that as a particular reason to choose a particular institute and center. I would use level of competition, you know, we know that, for example, NCI is incredibly competitive. Um, and we know that NIA aging uh, is less competitive and actually received a doubling of their budget a couple of years ago and, and, you know, still kind of struggles to get um, competitive proposals to, to give away all their money. So those kinds of things we want to take into consideration. Real quickly, I want to show you why this is important. Um, so when we search for SBIRs, we can collect or click on a specific project um, and we can read their abstract. We can find out who their program official is. See, here's the PO right here. Here's who they're, they're talking to about their project. That might be somebody that you want to reach out to if your project is along the similar lines. Um, it tells you what their... Um, here it tells you what they applied under. So did they go under a special solicitation or did they go under the omnibus? It tells you their study section. We did not talk about study sections today, but that's another thing I love to talk about is understanding study sections, which as we talked about earlier are different than your institutes and centers. Um, and it tells you the administering institute and center. So um, this is all important information for you to Google or to um, search abstracts of projects that are like yours. Just make sure they're funded by SBIR, STTR. So we're looking for those R41, 42, 43, 44 codes. Um, and then st you'll start to see patterns of particular institutes and centers, of particular program officers, um, of you can see their budget size, which is also really important because you can start to see, are they really funding at 300,000 or can I expect to get a budget above that funded? Um, so all those kinds of things we can learn by searching this public database in Reporter. That's awesome. That is a lot of information. Oh my God, I love this site. I'm a total nerd data you geek. That on it. I know that we're at two o'clock. I have a couple of, of clarifying curious questions based on the impact score. So did I hear you say that the lower the score, lower the number, the yeah. better? Yeah. And then yeah. you said that sometimes as they get near the end of the fiscal year, they will dip down and, and, and consider those that they didn't previously consider. Is that just something they automatically do or do folks have to resubmit or is it just kind of hanging out there in a pile? Yeah, it hangs out in a pile. Okay. It hangs out in a pile and uh, program officers then sort of go and see if they have something that can help spend up that money. Now, you're not going to be picked up if you get a score of a 50, 
you're not going to be picked up. If you're on the bubble and you even went to council and you know you got almost all the way there um, and they tell you no, you still may be picked up, you know, toward the end of September. Um, but but it's it, and you have to have been scored. Half of all proposals are not scored at all. Um, and and you know, your your score has to be somewhere near funded fundable range. Okay, that's good to know. So I am I am learning by joining these webinars. <laughs> and NIH is deep. Like I know, I know. Fast of, of opportunity, <laughs> but also lots of information and pathways. So if it's it's, it's a little higher than the what I would say the 101 yeah. <laughs> level. Yeah. So I'm glad that a lot of these folks are joining. If we were to do a follow up session um, on today, what do you think would be a good use of our time? Like maybe diving into these study, you know, the like the operate, you know, what study sections are versus institutes and, you know, kind of figuring, figuring that landscape out or something else or what do you Yeah, think? that may be understanding scoring and, um, you know, understanding uh, study sections and scoring. Um, Some of the inside baseball. Yeah. If you will. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe something like that. From my colleague, but okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is great. I, I I have shared in the chat that we are working on, uh, we will be working a little bit more on, but I know during the NSF sprint, we all talked about possibly doing an NIH sprint. And so I'm going to start talking to you and, the, and, and our colleagues, the consultants about doing one of those after the first of the year, pulling one of those together. So a lot of people have expressed their interest in that. We're going to collaborate with the uh, ecosystem up in Chicago as well. So um, so everybody be on the lookout for more communication about that coming in December. I have to uh, meet some more with my um, consultants to figure out availability and, and the, the, the ecosystem in Chicago to kind of figure out where they are in this and things of that nature. But be on the lookout for that messaging coming up soon. And Chris, you did a great job. That's a lot to cover. And yes. thank you for the interactiveness and showing us the board, you know, going online. And that's great. No problem. And if the person who had that specific question wants to hang on for a second, I'll answer that. Yes. Good idea. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let me find. Let's see if this, I should know the name, but I can't find it. Hold on. Okay. Jing Wei. Jing Wei Lu, is he still online? Ah, or I think. Yeah. Xingwei is still online, but I don't know if Xingwei has heard us. Let's yeah, see. I heard it. Ah, there we go. Great. Perfect. So um, the question was about um, if you're, you know, I'll say generally speaking that all money has to be kept within the U.S. Now, some agencies are a little bit more agreeable to this than others. NSF, it's, there's no way around it. NIH, if you're able to sort of justify that what you're seeking outside the US can only be acquired from that particular source, they can make exceptions. It's not enough to say, oh, my favorite developers in India. That's, that's not enough. It has to be, I can only get this chemical from this one company and they happen to be in Germany. It's the only place in the world that's available. So it has to be pretty specific. Um, so and, uh, it, sorry. Oh, that's okay. And you you ask about um, can you pay for it with your own money, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I just literally had this conversation with somebody before I hopped on this webinar. Um, what I would do. The challenge is that you know, for example, she she was buying uh, uh, a particular company was making lateral flow tests for her, and they're outside of the U.S. Now we can't do the experiments without the lateral flow. So it's not like we can just not talk about the lateral flow, but she can't use SBIR money to pay for it. So the, the way around it, I think, is to address it and to, for example, put in the budget justification um, the lateral flow tests and where they'll be purchased from, and then just explicitly state and underline that they will be purchased with non-SBIR money. And we don't typically put in information about anything not covered by SBIR dollars, but in this instance, you can't do one without the other. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I got what you mean. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I would even in the research strategy in your work plan, when you're talking about it, you know, I would say um, whatever it is, 
you know, purchased from, you know, not, not using non SBIR dollars, um, just be clear in the work plan. We cannot assume that a reviewer is going to read <clears throat> all of the documents. And so you need to put it in multiple places just to make sure they understand that you know the rule. That's what we're trying mm -hmm. to tell them is that you know the rule and you're you're following that rule. Oh, okay. So we Thank have you. someone. Thanks, sorry, you're welcome. Apologies. We have someone with their hand up. I want to make. I just don't notice that. So Don Barry, it looks like she has a question, but I want to make sure we've covered Jingwei. Jingwei, uh, yes, you feel I, good? I'm good. I'm good okay. now. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, that was abrupt. I apologize. <laughs> Hi, Don. So I. Hi, I kind of wanted to build off of that question. So if we have previously worked with a university outside of the US um, and we continue to work with them, we were saying we would only we were only going to do SBBR, right? SBIR rather mm -hmm. than STTR. So can we still if we still work with them, would it be same, the same sort of thing saying um, in the budget that we're working with them, but the money is coming not from the grant, it's coming from the company? Um, where, what university is it? Um, university. What, what country is it in? It's Spain. Okay. Um, you know, I think that would be a program officer question because okay. they may tell you it's okay to, to do it. Okay. Um, so I think that would, that would be a program officer question and, and, you know, fair warning, they may tell you it's okay to do, and then reviewers will rip you apart, but, um, <laughs> you, you know, it's just kind of the, the chance you take, but, um, if they're, if they're a partner and they're doing actual work and they're important in the project, I, I don't know if I would propose that. Okay. For SBIR, because it just doesn't, if they're doing a small thing, you know, sometimes it's like a small thing, but if they're a major partner and they're mm -hmm. doing a lot of the work, that, that feels a little outside of SBIR. Okay. So, okay. That's helpful. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. I think we're good. I don't see any other hands up. And wow. I think I see one hand from Martin. Oh. Do you? Oh, where's it at? I missed it. But Martin, come online. Hi. Um, hi. Oh, hi. I see it. So basically, this is uh, I presented back in May in Chicago. A a um creating and I I did a ten minute presentation before the Department of Defense's Manufacturing Innovation Center in Chicago at Goose Island. Uh, the entitled the slide or the presentation was uh, creating next generation MRI systems using software defined radio. As a result of that, I followed up with the NIH in a webinar and I showed them what I had presented like the month earlier and they replied back on a Saturday saying that they said that my stuff was novel and they were interested in me submitting an executive summary and said that I had met a couple of their funding programs, um, as well as other agencies would be prospectively interested in what I'm presenting. So long story short, that was back in May. So here we are in November of 2022. Now I have two local universities that are interested in collaborating with me on it. And but they want me to I'm a techie, so I'm not so much the medical person. My family is, but I'm not. But they said, please work to put your on pager in the format of specific aim section as described in the NIH grant application guidelines. They said this is the most important uh, starting point for any NIH grant application. So is that is that true? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Wait this up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I was talking about. Putting that specific aims document together. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. And Chris, is that something, so just to add on to that, because I know Martin expressed interest in an in NIH sprint, is that something that a sprint would work on, work through? As yes, partner? yes. Okay. Yeah, the AIMS document is really this the starting Our, point. Okay, good to yeah. know. Thank All righty. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, thanks for hanging on a little bit longer, Chris. I really appreciate it. No problem. It. No problem. Thanks, guys.